Thank you, uh, Alexi, for inviting me, and thank you, Landup, for organizing this meetup. I'm going to talk about a question that's been very important to me. But All right, uh, so um, the question that's been important to me is like, can Scala go faster, and specifically where Scala compiler can go faster? And uh, like, what's the limit? Um, how much are we living off of, on the table right now? And as I was thinking about uh, this question, I realized that the search for high performance compiler implementation can have two outcomes. Either uh, there is a, a, a fast, a high performance um, compiler implementation that I'm looking for, or maybe Scala has a design language flaw that prevents from building one. You just, don't, you just can't make it. Um, so Scala has been released in 2004, but its real popularity rise started in 2006 with Scala 2.0 release. By 2012, uh, as people were building larger uh, projects and adopting Scala at, at companies, um, the compiler speed became the top concern. Over the years, uh, many efforts went into fixing this problem. I work on the redesign of Zinc, uh, which is the incremental compiler for Scala. There's a piece of software that figures out what to recompile uh, in your project when you make, make a change. And the algorithmic uh, redesign led uh, to like 10 to 50x improvements on large code bases. And in 2018, uh, uh, a lot of people in the Scala community list uh, compiler performance still as a top priority. Um, during my work on the incremental compiler, um, I stumbled upon uh, Brad Victor's talk, Inventing on Principle, and it was a real revelation for me. Uh, Brad's talk was overflowing with idealistic ideas on how programming should be done, and I saw a deeply compelling um, case for um, uh, this principle that he talked about where you make, when you make a change in a program, you should see the, uh, like experience the effects of it immediately. And that consequence went much deeper than just saving time. It just changed the way you program. And after watching it, I went to tell all of my friends about it. And um, I started to wonder why I was working on a programming language that was so far removed from what I saw. And did I work in the wrong cause? The 2016 was a hobo year for me. That's actually the time when I pick up this, this style of outfit that I'm wearing today. <laughs> uh, in 2016, I don't have a perf cycle to worry about um, or like a paper deadline. Um, and in that year, I interviewed, I happened to interview with Facebook and I talked to um, a hack team and learn about their um, uh, type checker project. Uh, uh, they have a, a, a project internally that handles static checking uh, at the scale of tens of millions of lines of code. Uh, it's massively parallel and distributed. And now I became a hobo with a plan. Uh, I started the Kentucky Mill project with um, the goal to explore the limits of compilation uh, performance. Um, instead of abandoning the ship um, and going for JavaScript that Brad Victor used in his talk, um, I had an ambition goal in mind. Keep the best of the compile and run uh, and make it so quick that it feels magical. Um, and while I was a hobo, I uh, still didn't want to uh, waste my time on a, hope a hopeless plan. So I ran an experiment. I generated simple uh, Scala and Java code side by side, um, and se except for language differences, uh, they look the same. Um, and in the code, I stay away from Scala's rich type system features that are normally attributed as a source of slow compilation time. Uh, people say Scala compiler is just solving harder problem. Um, so I compile both and, and compare the execution times. <coughs> On the chart, you see a wide gap between uh, the two compilers, and fundamentally, both are solving the same pro uh, the, the problem of the same complexity. On, on the on the x-axis here, uh, you have number of classes generated of this shape. Um, so, Scala compiler is six times slower than Java uh, Java one, and whatever Scala compiler is doing, it's a waste. Um, 
this is just a simple experiment, but it, if it didn't reveal anything dramatic, uh, it would be harder for my, uh, to convince myself that I'm off a promising start. Um, so while my experiment shows um, that there are potential gains in the single threaded performance, I thought that the real riches um, are in, await in the world of parallelism. And people working on, uh, on programming, language, uh, uh, programming languages consider parallelizing compilers to be extremely difficult or maybe like impossible to solve as a problem. But the hack team built a non-trivial type checker with a massively parallel and uh, distributed architecture. Interestingly, they designed the language enabled that in architecture. So we can reframe our, so kind of the new question is, can Scala have a highly parallel compiler? Um, and can we borrow hack ideas? And can we do that without dramatically changing the language? <coughs> So, okay, so we want to build a highly uh, parallel compiler. Mm, if you plot the time across the pipeline of different phases uh, in the compiler, you see one standing out, which is typer. This is the heavy, uh, heavyweight phase that um, takes roughly 30 to 40% of the total execution time in the compiler. It's also the most difficult one to reason about, um, and we'll focus on it. So this is the final architecture of uh, uh, type checking we are heading for. Um, and oh boy, it's like a lot of going on in this slide. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to unpack it. And the, the goal is to stack as many boxes uh, on each other. That's the measure of parallelism we get. And uh, you see the parsing phase on the far, uh, far left um, end, uh, which is trivial to parallelize. You just parse source files uh, independently in parallel. Then on far um, right end, you have massively parallel uh, type checking of uh, your implementation of your uh, method bodies. And that part depends on the stuff in the middle uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll get back to. <coughs> For comparison, um, <laughs> this is the current design of Scala C. It appears to be simpler, but the uh, picture is uh, imperfect. So kind of our complexity is packed into like what in software we know as a big ball of mud. And what we have done in the previous slide is we have carefully broken up hidden complexity to small manageable pieces. Um, so when I ask my friend that does research in programming languages why researchers do not spend more time on parallel architectures for type checking, she cut me short with it's a messy data dependence problem. And uh, I'm now getting at the core of it. Let's uh, suppose we want to resolve a type T in this little example. We, um, we f first ask, is uh, type T defined in class B? No. Is it defined in class A? Yes. It's right there uh, underlined. So we got it. Now um, let's uh, change the code a little bit. And still we have the same task. We want to resolve type T. Oh, I made a mistake. So you guys, uh, we uh, um, remove that declaration. Sorry. Um, <coughs> so we want to resolve that. Uh, pretend it just doesn't exist. We want to resolve type T. We ask if it exists in class B. It doesn't. Uh, we ask if it exists in class A. It doesn't. But we see there is an import with the wildcard. Um, so we want to ask whether the type T exists in C. But what is C? So first, we need to resolve C. And again, we go and ask, is C defined in class A? It's not. Uh, but we are declared in package objects. So now I kick off global search for C. And I see, I see C defined in, in package foo in the other source file. So now uh, we have a handle on C. And we can ask uh, whether um, T is defined there. And we resolve T to that declaration over here. Um, and, <coughs> and um, so that's kind of the shape of the problem that compilers solve. Uh, that's one of the many problems they, 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 they solve. Um, and we, uh, we can start untangling uh, our like, messy dependency problem by dragging codes to sides and drawing a dividing line. Um, between the two columns. And the idea is uh, you, we, we s separate definitions and signatures. They go on the left, and implementation goes on the right. 
<laughs> and uh, we'll call the, 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 the interface of our program the skeleton and, uh, um, and implementation a tissue like muscles. And uh, the definitions hang on the skeleton. They are attached to specific p points in, in, in skeleton where, where signatures of methods are. Um, <coughs> so yeah, we have skeleton on the left and we have little boxes for the implementation on the right. And then the pink, ar uh, pink arrows represent uh, dependencies. Um, so um, there is one property, important property, that uh, dependencies go uh, from the right. They only cross this line and go to the left. They don't uh, cross-reference here. Um, <coughs> and then um, the skeleton is more tricky. It has self-references. So types can refer each other. Signatures uh, refer uh, other types. Uh, yes, there was a question. Yes, I, that was the next sentence coming. <laughs> um, uh, so for now, we, we assume there's no type inference for uh, method signatures. Uh, uh, types are uh, return types for methods are set. Um, OK, so uh, we have one win uh, here that we kind of divide, decompose the problem into two big components, uh, type checking of this side and this side. Um, and then. Um, the problem with the skeleton is that it's expensive to compute in Scala and frankly in any other modern uh, programming language. Uh, so we have to parallelize uh, the computation of, of the skeleton itself. And it's, it's a tricky problem because uh, the, the pieces of the skeleton or bones, if you will, <coughs> cross-reference each other. And um, that problem doesn't exist in Hack. That's one of the design decisions that they made over there. That uh, it's uh, like uh, these uh, arrows exist, but they're very easy to work out. In Scala, they can be very complicated. <coughs> in order to avoid, uh, avoid threat contention, um, I would like to figure out the order in which to pre uh, process all those pieces up front. And um, this problem sounds, silk, uh, sounds circular at, at the outset. Like the order is determined by the dependencies in the skeleton. Uh, and and uh, those dependencies are only available when uh, we compute the types. And we actually want to compute the types. Uh, so um, uh, to break that cycle, I came up with the notion of outline types. And the idea is to approximate the real types with the very simple types that are uh, extremely cheap to compute and capture dependencies. They are good enough to just capture the dependencies. <coughs> so once um, outline types are uh, computed, they give you a kind of IKEA-style assembly manual for building uh, up our skeleton. Outline types give you um, a manual that tells you the order of bonds that you put together. Um, so let's go, but go back to our architecture. The computation of types uh, in the tissue of the program uh, is on the, on the far right. This is the kind of the muscles uh, that we're computing here. In the middle, we have the computation of, of the skeleton. Uh, and you can ha see many small boxes arranged um, in the order of uh, arrows that we computed. That's our assembly plan. Um, and then there is a small uh, box over here uh, for outline types. Um, <coughs> and this computation is not uh, uh, possible to parallelize, but the bet is that it will be so quick to compute that uh, the whole scheme will make sense. And uh, fast enough mean, or cheap enough here means is that this little box is faster to compute order of magnitude faster to compute than the rest. Um, and we would like, uh, in the end, what we are aiming for is we would like to avoid this comical situation where we spend more time figuring out the plan for assembly than just building the thing. <coughs> so um, outline types are stripped down to their uh, essence. Um, they're only concerned with uh, signatures of classes, objects, type definitions, and vals. Um, I cut everything uh, non-essential to computing the uh, uh, dependencies. And Outline types, for example, do not support uh, subtype checking, which is weird in a programming language build uh, around subtype checking. And they're purely structural. Um, 
they, they are, so outline types are so stripped down that initially it's hard to imagine that they can sustain Scala's complexity, like the weight of the complexity. And I had no idea whether this will work out uh, and whether it will be f fast enough to compute, but I was eager to find out. Um, and I went on building Kentucky Bill project. So um, <coughs> as a proof of concept, I decided to process Scala P, which is this not a very well-known project, but it's tiny, self-contained. Uh, it has 2,000 li lines of code. And so it's small enough that it's uh, easy to prototype on top of, uh, of it uh, to just process the code. And it's not too small to be completely trivial. Um, and from the first line of Kentucky Mule code, uh, like the, the, the coding style I uh, adopted was performance paranoid. Um, at each step of, of implementation, I was very carefully measuring uh, uh, the speed uh, uh, that, that, that I was getting. And the performance uh, numbers initially looked great. I established a baseline of processing 4 million lines of code per second, which is like uh, compared to what we normally observe, uh, uh, the, the kind of the regular performance is 3,000 lines of code per second for, for compiler. That's actually very good. Um, so th that, that, <coughs> that number was amazing. Um, so I knew that the, the numbers I got uh, so far were purely uh, uh, mm, for validation whether my idea like, has legs to stand on. Like, if that didn't work out, like, there is no point in investing in anything more complicated. But obviously, that was not a representative uh, sample. Um, <coughs> so um, I went on more ambitious. Uh, uh, a kind of input um, that would include the, the language features that I suspected would be very difficult to um, implement it, uh, in, in, in outline types. Um, and I felt they, they might be actually the potential breaker, uh, deal breakers. Um, so the next task was to beat uh, uh, deal breakers head on. Um, I picked Scala standard library um, uh, as my input as a test case, and I listed all uh, language features that I, I will need to implement. Um, starting with like a really great performance and my predetermined list of 21 features, I went on imp implementing them. And I, want, I no want to show you the result right now. Um, oh, yes. Let's try and going to the right. and. The trick is I don't see this on my screen. So I'm going to turn around for a sec. Um, OK, uh, that's good enough. Um, so yes, we have Kentucky Mule running here. And kind of the vision of where I'm going with Scala, um, Scala's compilation performance is this. On every, every keystroke, um, we, uh, we process 30,000 lines of code per second. Or uh, sorry, we, we process 30 lines of code. And you can see kind of the feedback loop um, where I'm, I'm doing some analysis over there, kind of like global analysis of dependencies. And um, for example, if I introduce um, a cyclic dependency, uh, so list inherits from sequence, and here we <coughs> um, make sequence inherit from uh, list, uh, we find that cycle and it takes um, uh, 104 milliseconds to, to find that. Um, so um, that's where I'm going uh, with the compiler performance. Um, that's kind of where I long term I would like Scala to be. And uh, if we type red. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a living proof that this idea, not bread, but like what you saw. Um, <laughs> and now I have to figure out how to go back to my talk. Yes. Um, 
So yeah, in, in, in this demo, you saw that it works. It actually processes uh, a very complex uh, uh, code base. Um, um, it uh, takes 200 milliseconds to do the full analysis of 30,000 uh, lines of code. And that's a bargain for the assembly plan. Um, and it inspires a great deal of confidence that this overall architecture actually uh, can like, pan out. <laughs> so now I would, have to, I would like to switch gears and talk a, a little bit about low-level uh, uh, bits. So internally, uh, compilers often have a concept of uh, a type completer. And it's a function that goes from unit to type. Um, it's a lazy computation, essentially. Um, and recall the big ball of mod uh, that, that we saw on the, on the slide earlier and, um, uh, and its messy dependency problem. Because the order of type checking is not uh, known up front, the way people deal with this in Java C or in Java compiler, Scala compiler, even Swift compiler, is that they set up um, a set of lazy uh, computations and just let laziness to figure out the order. Um, and it's a, it's a very uh, kind of uh, good technique, but it comes with a set of downsides that I observed when I was working on Scala compiler. It's uh, essentially what, what we do is we perform a deeply recursive depth first search throughout the graph of dependencies. And what does this lead to is this different goal to attribute uh, the difficult attribution of the cost. So if you're looking at a piece of code and trying to understand its performance characteristic, you never know whether this is slow or it just happens to trigger a long chain of computations, like lazy computations. It's very hard to reason about this. Um, the other problem is that these deep recursive call, uh, call chains are very unfriendly to JVM profilers. So most of the tools that you use for understanding performance are out of window. And um, Lastly, there is this problem that some of the types you load are coming from uh, binary files on, on disk. Those are like your external libraries. And uh, this, loading these types is also done in a, a lazy manner. You read a couple of bytes, you go back to type checking, uh, use this information, figure out that you need more uh, information, go back to reading, and, and you kind of s s uh, switch context back and forth, and that leads to I.O. trashing. And these pain points made me consider an alternative abstraction. <coughs> I came up with the notion of uh, interruptible type um, uh, uh, completers inspired by uh, a cooperative multitasking. It's the technique for control flow uh, that was used in Windows 3.1, for example. And the idea is that the completers uh, are tasks that return either a type or yield the control back to the, the event loop. Um, <coughs> if they are stuck on the, the, some dependency that hasn't run yet. And then um, the control uh, uh, is returned to the, to the event loop with the information what the, the completer was stuck on, like wha wha what's missing. And once the dependency, that missing dependency is satisfied, satisfied the, the scheduler will rerun this uh, computation. That's kind of the basic idea. Um, so in this scheme, tasks are organized in a work queue. Um, and tasks are isolated from each other. Uh, so they lend themselves to very simple performance attribution. You just look at the task, and that's their cost. Um, you, we don't have the deep uh, stack traces anymore. We, we have shallow uh, uh, stack traces, which are excellent for JVM profilers. And we have now the freedom, like for the scheduler, we can just ask systems programming friend how to implement it. And, <coughs> and the, the, this idea is actually one single idea that I wanted uh, to decouple the dependency, dependency discovery from uh, dependency computation. Those are now separate. In the old scheme, when you trigger lazy computations, they're like, as soon as you run into your dependency, you go and, and trigger the computation. Um, and I rec recently came uh, across this uh, quote on spacecraft design. Um, and it actually kind of clicked for me in, in, in software context. And in, in software, like our software deteriorates over time for a variety of reasons. And compilers are not uh, uh, immune from that problem. And the only thing that uh, kind of prevents from collapse are good interfaces. Um, 
So the, this simple idea of uh, cooperative multitasking actually have, has a far-reaching implications. Of, um, by changing this, uh, the interface, it kind of unlocked the application of uh, decades of systems programming research. People have thought about work queues and schedulers for a very long time. And I had a profound aha moment when I learned um, uh, from my systems programming friends, um, or actually a friend who is sitting here in the audience, uh, that there is a very simple low overhead scheduler or scheduling algorithm for these interruptible completers um, that uh, it's a parallel scheduler. So the computation of outline types themselves can be parallelized. And so this one little box uh, in, in my architecture slide can be actually broken up into smaller boxes. Um, and I was very surprised by that. Um, finally, uh, I would like to talk about, one, I'll make one point on, on tactics. Um, so there are two ways uh, to go about finding a fast implementation of a compiler. For, uh, you can first implement all language features and go and implement all uh, compiler phases and then start profiling and optimizing. That's kind of the classical way. The other way is to implement a tiny subset of language um, features. Let's say what language is supported in 70s. Um, and you implement that, uh, that set of features end to end. You have actually a working compiler. And you want a great performance at this very small core. And then you iterate over language features um, under this constraint of defending the excellent uh, performance you already have. Um, and I like the um, um, second method uh, more uh, because the search space is simpler. Um, I, at, at each step, I know what language features I'm, I'm missing yet to implement. Um, and uh, each step is pretty small. And if I'm losing uh, performance for whatever reason, I can back off and figure this out. Um, <coughs> in the, with the common uh, approach, you have this complex system, and you're trying to poke at it. And it's basically shooting in the dark. You maybe figure out some inefficiency, or maybe not. And uh, it actually quickly becomes demoralizing. And that's one of the reasons why Scala C is not improving uh, um, um, its performance. Just you, you never know whether you, like, if you spend one week more in, with the profiler, we like find something or not. And then your boss comes and says, like, maybe you should switch gears to something else. So it's time to wrap up. Um, so are we up for, a, like, another, uh, for a rewrite of Scala compiler? And conveniently, uh, we have one rewrite at our hands called Dotty. Um, so recall the experiment we started with, um, where I presented you a chart, a performance chart. Um, I added Dotty um, as a, um, kind of this blue line. It lands. It's a fresh implementation of a Scala compiler. It lands exactly the same uh, <laughs> place as Scala compiler. Um, and I rerun this experiment on non-trivial code basis on the kind of actual projects. It's kind of, it's actually astonishing how close they come together. So it's not about rewrite. I believe that Scala compiler performance is a hard problem, but it's also a solvable problem. And my proposal is to re-examine the implementation, break down the big ball of mud into phases with the intent of parallelization. Uh, pick interruptible completers as this basic uh, building block. Um, and this interface uh, enables decoupling and unlocks those opportunities of borrowing great ideas from systems programming community for performance. And lastly, start with a minimal end-to-end -end, um, implementation, iterate over language features, and defend performance at each step. Thank you. And I will have to run in like 10 minutes, uh, so I'll take questions. Yeah, just do the questions for the morning. Any questions? Yeah, so I just want to ask mine again because I, I didn't quite understand the answer. So how do you work with uh, uh, explicit high validation? Oh, yeah, I, I forgot, I forgot to, uh, to get back to that point. Uh, uh, the answer to this is, uh, Thank you. Um, 
basically the idea is that here uh, you work with the assumption that um, the global resource, which is a skeleton, is fixed. It's pre-computed already. But the inferred types uh, break that assumption. So you insert a little ugly face here uh, that says, whatever inferred types I have here, I will like, leave holes, and then I fill out those holes here. And that phase is sequential. And the idea here is that if you have, uh, like you have one lever as a user of a language to kind of pull, if you want more parallelism, annotate your types. If, uh, if you don't want to annotate, then you kind of fall back so to sequential execution. In the worst case, if everything was to be but it would be sequential. Yes. Thank you.